organization and legislation to order. It is 10.33, and uh, we are being recorded. The first order of business this morning is to make sure everybody can be heard and uh, can hear. And we do have one member of our committee who is um, attending remotely. And so I need to announce that that is Darcy Dumont, Councilor Dumont, we have be participating remotely um, because physical attendance would be unreasonably difficult under state law. Um, so I want the, rec the record to reflect the uh, fact that GOL member Darcy Dumont is attending remotely via speakerphone on this date of June 16, 2021, because physical attendance is unreasonably difficult. So the first thing I want to do is make sure Darcy can hear me. So Darcy, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Um, then I want to just make sure all the members of my uh, remaining members here are physically present. So Sarah, um, you can hear Darcy and I'm present and I can just hear hit your button. Darcy and I can hear everybody else in the room. Okay, thank you. And uh, Pat. If you just wait. I'm physically present. Okay, and you can hear Darcy and you can be heard. And Mandy? I am in the room and I can hear Darcy and I assume I can be heard. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, and of course the chair is present and can hear and be heard. We have up on the screen the agenda for today's meeting. Um, and the first and uh, item of business is going to be interviews for FinCom. We have two interviews. The first one started about four minutes ago. Um, we'll be interviewing um, Rika Clement, and then uh, a bit later this morning, we'll be interviewing Bob Hegner. Then we will uh, turn to uh, our recommendation for that uh, position. Then we have a moratorium bylaw that has been brought to us that we need to review and um, make a recommendation on, and we have a citation that uh, a couple of, of, of my colleagues and myself have brought that we'll be reviewing. And then I'll just give you a brief update on DAB and where we stand there. And then we have two sets of minutes, which the chair has already reviewed and are actually on SharePoint. If you want to see, the changes were quite minor. Um, I thought that uh, um, they, were, they were very good. So I appreciate your work. Um, so any questions about the agenda? We're set to go. I'm sorry, dear. Did you have a question? You got to push your button. Oh, damn it. It's all right. Watch your French. We ha <laughs> I said damn it. I, I didn't say That's, the F word right. yet. It's Italian. Okay. <laughs> yes. We had, uh, Mandy and, and I had a resolution uh, addressing financing the Chris. Right. And I understand that it's going straight to council. That is correct. My concern is that it could get slowed down because they're going to send it back here. Why wouldn't... I can't predict what they're going to do. Right, I don't, so why don't we look at it today? I felt A, it was much too much last minute, and I felt B, that I didn't see the value added with GOL. This is really a, an issue more of uh, what the council wants to do and going forward, and um, I felt that I just I made the decision not to put it on the 48-hour. I'm uncomfortable with the decision well, that's I noted want, because I, I feel like it's yeah. a way of not intentional, and I and I, no. I acknowledge that wholeheartedly. Right. But it's uh, it can now get sent back to In GOL, theory, that's true. Yeah. And that seems to be a redundancy that we used to stop addressing the issue. Well, I think that would be a good argument to make at council. Um, I might actually be sympathetic to that argument, um, the redundancy. Also realize that we uh, do supposedly only whether an act, whether an item is clear, consistent, and actionable. We can't really discuss the content, or at least we're not supposed to. So that was the other reason. No, I understand that, and okay. and so it's, yeah. You know. Okay. So everybody set with the agenda. Um, I'm going to ask Rika to come forward. Rika Clement is a candidate for the FinCom vacancy. And um, she has graciously agreed to come and be here physically present with us today, masked. <laughs> um, what we do is I have each of the members of the uh, committee ask a question. 
they're allowed to follow up either immediately upon that question or after we've gone through everyone, they can also ask a second question if they wish. Um, I ask that you try to keep to a two minute limit. I'll probably interrupt you at some point um, just so we can get through in a timely fashion. Um, and I'm actually gonna start with Darcy if, uh, if she's ready and able, um, and then I'm gonna turn to the members of the committee who are physically present. So Darcy, um, do you have a question for Rika? Uh, yes, uh, you could speak yes. a little louder. It, that would help, but yes, we can hear you, but it would be helpful if you were a little louder. Hey, Rika, no problem. Want. Thank you for the question. Um, well, I guess I, I don't know all the details of the um, budget right now, but I would say that budgets always present difficult questions and indicate what our priorities are. And if our priority is, you know, racial justice and, and climate equity, then we'll have to be figuring out how to rank those higher than other things that have previously been more important, so I, that would be, that's partly why I'm interested in being on the committee and being part of that conversation. I don't think there's an easy answer. Okay, thank you. Um, Man, Mandy, you wanna go ahead? Sure, Please. you don't have an order thought out. Um, no, I'm not. So my question's on a similar item, which is, you know, you talked about some of your finance experience and experience in nonprofits and all, and I'm wondering if you have any experience dealing with budgets when the, you know, the program or the, the entity has been trying to add a program to a budget, and if so, can you talk about that experience and how that worked and, you know, sort of similar to Darcy's question, but yeah. Sure. Um, I have been at uh, nonprofits. They're often looking to do more than their current budget will allow. And uh, one of my main experiences, I guess I would reflect on, was when I was a director of a science center out in Boise, Idaho, where half of our income was earned and half of our income was contributed. And so, um, you know, that was a nice that was a nice aspect. We were able to earn some money uh, through admissions. And when we wanted to start new programs, we, we initially would look to philanthropy and look for grants and look for other sources of um, revenue that had interest in the program we were wanting to start. Uh, if that didn't work out, then we might, you know, look for a different program they could fund and allow to free up some of the earned income since we could, earned income had no restrictions on it. Um, so, you know, I don't know what it's like when you don't have that philanthropy, you know, that, that's a nice out that a nonprofit has that I'm, I don't think the town does. So, again, it's weighing the priorities and, um, you know, gathering the input from constituents as to, you know, what people feel is most important and, and making, making hard choices and, and living with them, uh, you know, and living with the consequence of some things that people have been passionate about are not getting the same kind of level of support, and, and that can be very challenging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Pat, do you have a question?
has impact on social economic, <laughs> uh, socioeconomic diversity in Amherst. Um, we have um, a lot of competing needs from residents. And, you know, while we say we're going to take in public opinion, when, would you always do that, I guess? Maybe that's the simplest way to ask the question. If the public is screaming for something that you think is physically or fiscally, sorry, mm -hmm. um, not prudent, what would you do? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, one of the things I wrote in my statement was, I mean, budget says, I mean, if you want to know what somebody believes, you look at how they spend their money, right? And so there's a lot of different ways you can approach that. And, you know, is it, is it we're going to spend the most, you know, the money in a way that benefits the most people or the, or the people who need it most? Or, I mean, those are philosophical questions. The other thing I would say is when you say, you know, the public is screaming for X, my experience and my gut, I'll say, is that the public is not necessarily, who's screaming is not necessarily representative. The squeaky wheel and, you know, it can often be a minority. So I do think it's important to have that public input, but it's also, I think, important to recognize that just because they're loudest doesn't mean they're most representative. Now, how, did you how do you figure out what is most representative? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I guess I'm, uh, how do you think, I have, yeah, how do you think, knowing yourself, and, and, and how do you, if you really felt strongly that something was the wrong decision, that, what would you do? Where would you, how would you decide that ultimately or finally? Am I being at all clear? How would I decide it ultimately? You know, a finance decision that you think is uh, inappropriate for any reason, and the public really supports it, uh, and uh, it seems like the larger committee supports it. Where do you, how? How might you respond, knowing yourself? I mean, I mean it, uh, you know. Yeah, well, my. I'm sure it's a fair question. I think it's a fair question. I, I, for myself, I guess I'd want to say no. The, but what I think about a little bit more is is my role to be representative or to do what I think is right? And I don't actually know. If, if that's something that they tell you or you figure it out on your own, I, I don't know how that plays out. You know, if, if, so I feel like that would be an important point for me to understand. Am I free to really act as I feel is right or am I here to represent what I hear from the town? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> You're welcome. I was gonna to turn to Sarah next, um, but, uh, but thank you, because in a sense, uh, Pat's question and your response uh, relates to my question. So if you, with your uh, uh, permission, Sarah, I'm going to just throw it in here. Um, your position is a non-voting member. So what do you make of that um, in terms of uh, both the question that Pat's asking and you know, why would you give all this time and energy to a body where in the end um, you don't have a vote? Because I think that participation is the only way to have any influence. And okay, here's something I really try to live by, and that is I show up, I pay attention, I tell the truth, mm -hmm. and I let go of the outcome. And that's how I would be approaching that. So mm -hmm. okay. that would be my answer. Thank you. All right. Sarah, thanks. If you. Hi. So I just want to give a, a little preference, uh, preface to my question, and that is I disagree with the other members of this committee in that um, I don't think that we should be asking people who are volunteering um, 
questions that are um, intended to expose someone's uh, political agenda. I feel like um, the, the volunteers that help us, like FinCom and the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals, should be people who are open-minded, who can think well, who can connect the dots, and who gather all of the information for the council to then help us make our political decisions. But I don't think of, of people who serve on those committees as politicians as of yet. Um, so that being said, my question to you is, could you possibly give me five different uses for a stapler other than its intended purpose? Wow, that's impressive. Okay. Paperweight. <laughs> Objet d'art. <laughs> Hammer. <laughs> right, good. Uh, Doorstop. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to channel that one. Uh, um, a stir. <laughs> that was fabulous. It took me a half an hour to think of three, so you brought I think I think that that's sufficient. Are you satisfied by that answer, Councillor, or no? I am thrilled by five? that answer. Uh, no, that I am thrilled. Thank you. Um, brief follow-ups. Um, Darcy, do you have a follow-up question or a second question? Thank you. Any other member of the committee have a follow-up question or a uh, second question that they'd like to ask Rika? How comfortable are you asking um, for uh, when you don't when you don't think you understand something? How comfortable are you just saying, "Gee, I don't know"? Can you explain that? I'm very comfortable with that. I, I, I partly I feel like where I am in my life, I'm willing to ask that because I'm guessing I'm not alone and I'm willing to do it. <laughs> Good. Okay. All right. Um, seeing no other hands raised. And uh, so, Rika, thank you very much for coming. And um, I will be back in touch very soon. As Great. I said, we'll be deliberating later this morning and we'll let you know. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Appreciate all your thank questions. You. Thanks. Take care. Uh, does anybody know where that phone is? Uh, what is, is, that, is, that, is that that thing is ringing? All right. Darcy, was that phone from you? It sounded like it was in the room. No, I, I think it was in the room. It was in the room. Okay, well. Bob, please take a seat. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being willing to be here physically present and to wear a mask. Um, that microphone, if the green light is on, it's, it is on, oh, great. So, um, so you, you're live, you're being recorded. <laughs> um, so the way we work it here, Bob, is I ask each of the members of the committee to ask one question. I'm gonna start actually with our remote member, uh, Darcy Dumont, you'll hear her voice, disembodied voice over the speaker. Um, I'll begin with Darcy and then we'll go around the horn. I allow um, a follow-up question or a second question if uh, committee members so desire, and we'll try to keep it to 15 minutes. And I ask you to try to keep your answers to about two minutes, um, if you could. Um, so that's the, that's the drill. Great, Great. okay. So Darcy, um, do you have a question for Bob Hegner? Yeah, I'm here. And yell, Darcy, nice and loud. Please. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Acknowledgement of the 
Ah, okay. Yeah. Here we go. Thank you. No. It, the light was on, but not bright. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, if I understood the question correctly, uh, Darcy, you're asking what thoughts I have as to how the Finance Committee can reorient the budget to meet various priorities, including climate action and the CREST program and other priorities. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so um, in my, my experience is in the private sector, and I've learned over the last two years that the public sector financing is very different than uh, the private sector. And part of the challenges we face is that because of state law and I believe the charter, the town manager presents a budget uh, on May 1st and the finance committee can either reduce that budget or reject it altogether. There's really nothing where the finance committee can say, hey, we'd really rather have you spend X on this than, than X on that. Um, the only mechanism that we have is the guidelines that we publish in the fall. I can't remember the specific date, but it's around November or so. And that gets sent to the council for approval. Um, and a lot of things happen between the fall and May, and there's not much we can do about it. So um, in terms of where we could find money, you know, we might be able to find money from the public safety um, fund. Um, it's challenging. Uh, there's also the fire department that needs money that really doesn't come up in a lot of these discussions. So I, it's, it's a challenge. I don't have a good answer to it. However, I think it would help if we somehow could have some dialogue between when the budget guidelines are set and when the budget is presented on May 1st to have a back and forth as to whether the Finance Committee and the Council is kind of in sync with where the town manager is going. I should also point out that a lot of the budget is set by um, uh, uh, committees other than the, the, the town manager, including the, um, the education, you know, the elementary budget and the regional school budget and the, the Jones library, library budget. So a lot of the budget and the um, things that affect the town's finances are sort of balkanized into different groups. And um, it, it would, it's very different than the private sector where everything just comes down in one package, you know, you, and everything's back and forth. So, so my, my suggestion would be that we have a more robust discussion between when the guidelines are set and when the budget arrives in order to have a back and forth. Great, thank you, thank you, Bob. Mandy, please. Thank you. Um, so I know you're seeking another term on, on the Finance Committee, so I'm curious what you've learned from your years that you've already served on the Finance Committee that allow you to contribute in more meaningful ways. Well, I, as I said in my statement of uh, intent, um, I learned a lot about the budget. Uh, and again, coming from the private sector, I learned about much more about public financing and public budgets. Um, and I think that what I've, what I think what I can bring based on my experience is a better understanding of what goes into the budget, how the budget is created, and then how the finance committee interacts with that. And, and I sort of said that in, in, in my previous answer is that I think that the process is not ideal. Um, and maybe we can modify that a bit. Um, but I also, I mean, I've learned just a whole lot about the, the liabilities that the town uh, faces, the long-term liabilities that don't really come up in conversations very often. For example, 
Um, there is uh, the, uh, the superintendent of public works uh, stated that it costs a million dollars a mile to resurface a road or a street um, along with sidewalks and curbs. And if you think about how many miles of roads we have, that's 137 or so. And if it lasts, you know, 25 years, we're looking at five, six million dollars a year just to keep the roads going. We obviously don't have that kind of money. So we have to make decisions as to what we're going to do. Um, there's also water and sewer infrastructure that um, we have no idea what's out there and what's, um, you know, what, what the liabilities are for that, as well as long-term uh, liabilities such as the OPEB um, liability, which is on the order of the town budget in terms of what, what the long-term liability is. So I've learned about how we have to see the, I, I have a better understanding of the bigger picture um, that will help me, you know, make comments on what to do when particular things come up. Pat. I'm building my question on something that you said, which was the process is not ideal or adequate. And you mentioned one change, which was to really have robust conversation. What else do you see as problematic and what might be some solutions? Well, what, what I see is the, the, the whole finance and budget process are basically balkanized. I mean, you've got the school committee that not only puts this, the elementary school budget together, but works with the other towns to put the regional school budget together. But my understanding is they're also negotiating the, um, the, the labor package that will you know, be presented to the town at some point. Um, we don't really, as you know, Pat, we don't really have much insight into where these budgets come from and how, how they're put together. They're sort of presented to us. And again, the, the option is cut something here or reject it altogether. And there, there should be something in between where we could say, gee, we'd like you to move money from here to here, or we'd like you to do this and that. And, and I understand there are constraints on, on doing that. Um, but um, the other thing is, again, a lot of events or decisions that affect the town's finances are done by um, committees and, and, and entities other than the manager and the finance committee. And for example, just the, the planning board or the, the zoning board can make a decision on you know, new construction, which has implications for the long-term finances of the town. And yet, none of that even comes before the finance committee, as far as I'm aware. So, so I, I, would, I would like to see a more um, coordinated budget and finance process where all of the various players work together to understand what is the whole, you know, what do we got? What, do we can, what can we spend? If we spend it here, what, are we got, what do you propose we cut there? And right now it's, it's, it's too many parts and no central mm -hmm. discussion or central conversation about do we really need to do that or is that the wisest you know thing we should do so so i would other than the you know the process that i mentioned i'd say if we could somehow have a more coordinated annual process it might help sarah hi so I'm just going to give you a little background on the question that I'm going to ask you, which is that um, I differ from the rest of this committee in that I, I don't feel that we should be able, each counselor to be able to come up with a, an unknown question for, um, for people who are interviewing for a position. Um, I think that that, and also I don't agree with follow-up questions, I feel like that is leaving open um, counselors to try to elicit from a volunteer that's volunteering to work on a board or committee um, to expose a political agenda or push towards a political agenda. 
And I feel that people who are volunteering on uh, FinCom and on uh, ZBA and Planning Board are actually people who are volunteers who are, should be able to connect the dots and they think well and they work well with each other and they can come up with facts um, that they can then present to town council for us to make decisions. I, I don't think that you're politicians yet and I don't think that you should be treated as such. So my question to you is, grape nuts or Lucky Charms? <laughs> I'm sorry. Is grape nuts, grape nuts or, lucky, or lucky Charms? <laughs> grape nuts or Lucky Charms. <laughs> I, don't eat, I don't eat either, actually. <laughs> I'm not a big cereal fan. <laughs> That's a good answer. Still revealing, I mean, still revealing. Is that uh, sufficient? She has a, you want a follow-up question? Here's now, my follow-up question. You just said that you don't agree with follow-up questions. I don't agree with it, but like, But it is the rules. So everyone seemed like to enjoy question. that question. Maybe you will as well. Can you, can you give me five different uses for a stapler other than its intended use? <laughs> Um, I guess you could, uh, I can give you one, which is you could like injure yourself. <laughs> you know, some people like to injure themselves. Self harm, okay. Um, uh, I guess you could, you could use it as a, um, a, a training device by, you know, kind of whirling it around or throwing it up in the air. Um, you could see how far you could throw it and see if you could set a new personal record every day. Um, I don't know. I think <laughs> I think I've come up with three, three. out of that's, your five. That's not bad. Um, the previous uh, candidate came up with four, but we gave her some help. <laughs> no, um, no pressure. Thank you. No pressure. Darcy, do you have a follow-up question or a second question for Bob? Okay. Any of the members of the committee present? Um, I have one question quickly. Um, your position is non-voting. How do you find that? Do you, do you find that that's a frustration? Do you find it's not an issue? And do you feel like, uh, even though you're not a voting member, that your voice is heard? You feel like um, it matters that you're there? What's your experience with the fact that you're a non-voting member of this committee? So um, first, my experience has been that I, I feel like I'm a full member of the committee. Mm -hmm. I feel like my voice is heard. Um, I put proposals out there, some of them are accepted, some of them are rejected, like every other proposal that the, the members of the committee make. So I don't feel that being a non-voting member means you're not a full member in terms of the deliberations of the committee. I actually support the notion that a volunteer member of the public should not be a voting member um, for, for two reasons. One is that I see my role as representing the residents and not being political, trying to be apolitical, um, and trying to think of what's the right thing for the residents of the town. And secondly, I'm not an elected member. I don't have constituents. I don't have people sending me emails saying, oh, I want you to vote this way, I want you to vote that way. And I shouldn't be. I, I don't think. It's up to me to be political or to, you know, make a take a vote on on a subject. I mean, the uh, the chair does um, ask for whether or not the resident members support the motion that's being voted on or not. So we have a chance to voice our opinion. But I, I think it's actually a good idea that we're not voting members. Okay. So uh, I see no more questions, and so I want to thank you again, Bob, sure. for coming. No problem. And uh, we will be deliberating shortly, and I will let you know what the decision of the committee is. But I think on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you for your two years of service already, and I'll be in touch soon. Okay, just so you know, I'm leaving tomorrow to be out of town for a few days, so. Okay, I will I'll probably be back in touch with you later today. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. For the members of the public who are glued to their TVs or watching this uh, at some other date,
I'm taking off my mask because we no longer have anyone present in the room. Um, and if someone does come in, we will put them back on. Um, at least that's what I'm doing. And my committee members are free to do whatever they wish. Um, <laughs> not to put any pressure on you all, but um, that's all right. It's all right. Just so people understand. Stapler question? Okay. Um, I think we should, we, on the agenda, we're going immediately to deliberations, so I'd like to do that. That's the next item on the agenda. Um, and I've learned from doing this in the past that what we, is I think a wise way of proceeding is to first discuss each candidate briefly and see if people have any thoughts or reactions or, and then to go to the question of what we want to do in terms of the vote. So. Um, I'm going to begin with uh, candidate Rika Clement, and I'm going to open the floor. And Darcy, you can um, uh, uh, just speak up. Uh, don't be shy. If you um, have something either at this point or at some point in our deliberation, just because uh, I don't know, is there any way we can? I think all she can do is just say, uh, I would like to say something. So. Um, Rika Clement, reactions. Mandy has her hand up, um, so I'll begin with Mandy. You know, as, as always, I'm always impressed with the candidates we get. You know, it, you know, just forces me to acknowledge how lucky this town is to have such qualified people willing to volunteer their time to help the government. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, Rika, I would say, you know, she. She showed an understanding of um, the the trade-offs that you have to make and what a budget signifies. We've heard a lot about that over the last year, and and she definitely recognized that how you spend your money does show the town and the residents um, what you prioritize. And you know, in this year of difficulties that we've had, I think that's an important thing to recognize um, that that's what we're struggling with, is how to do that. And so I, I appreciated her acknowledgement of that, that, you know, it's hard, but, but that is what we're trying to show through a budget. Other members, uh, Sarah, please go ahead. I agree with Mandy Joe that I'm always impressed by just the quality of people that are willing to volunteer to help government. And we are very, very fortunate. Um, I was very impressed by her. I was impressed with, um, I was impressed by her reaction to the stapler question. I really thought that it didn't throw her at all and that I, I feel like she didn't feel insulted and she was curious and playful and had some really great answers. Um, and I also like the thing that, that she said about the process that she goes through in which to make a decision. And uh, maybe it's just my recent mindfulness practice, but I really like the fact that it, she just seemed very calm and together. She's gonna collect facts. She's gonna take into consideration what other people are, are thinking. She definitely knows her own mind. She's gonna speak it, and, but my most favorite thing was, and then she's gonna let go of the outcome. And I feel that in order to make the decisions that we make, in order to listen to each other, I feel like that's one of the biggest things that allow us to still be able to listen to each other and to make intelligent decisions is to put it out there and then to let go of the outcome. So I, I, was, I was very impressed with her, her knowledge of budgets and also of um, how she expressed herself. Thank you. I have dittos both to Mandy State. Darcy, are there any thoughts that you wanted to uh, share with us on Rika Clement? Yeah. Thank you. 
My uh, comment is really directed more towards the chair um, and a kind of regret. One of the things that um, we usually ask and the chair should ask is whether the um, member understands the timing of, uh, especially someone who's not served on it. For Bob Hegner, it would not be an appropriate question. He knows he's been through it. But for someone who's never done this, um, the uh, timing of, of budgeting. So basically, as it says in our selection guidance, are you available for meetings, particularly during the budgeting season? Um, and so I, I'm unhappy with myself for not just mentioning that. I'm sure, given what we saw, she read this carefully and she yeah. took it into consideration. But it's, I think, a very good thing for us to uh, always bring that up. So I'm, I apologize for not bringing that up. Um, also, I did not ask her if she had any questions about FinCom. And our past practice has been to have a member of FinCom present. I did reach out to the chair. Um, he was not available. Um, of course, the last time we did this, uh, he was a member of this committee, so it's not a problem. But um, again, that's something that, that I should have paid more attention to. I, anyway, I reached out and he just couldn't make it. But we should at least ask. And so again, that's on me. Um, but I agree with everyone, a very impressive candidate. Um, and, uh, um, and I don't know what we're going to do about that phone. If there's a way to unplug it, I would really like to do that. I was worried if we unplug it, we disconnect Darcy, though. Oh, that's true. I don't know. All right. Well, I apologize to the public that so we can't control the phone. Um, so if we could turn to Mr. Hegner. Um, and again, comments, reactions, thoughts. Again, just for the public's sake, if, obviously, if they're we're paying attention. Um, he is up for, he is, uh, has served for two years, and so he is asking for a second term. Any thoughts, reactions, comments on, on Bob Hegner? Mandy? I mean, I, I thought he showed his growth in answering the questions of the learning experience that he went through over two years, and, and um, through answering the questions could show what he would bring how he would utilize that experience over the last two years serving on the committee going forward for another two that, you know, if, if we reappointed him, that, that he would have. Um, you know, there's no question he's also qualified, you know. Um, so I, I appreciated the answers he gave about his thoughts on the last two years of his service. Sir? Um, I, I agree with Mandy Joe. I mean, I, you know, having been on finance before, I realize what a steep learning curve it is, voting or not, non-voting, you know, your first couple of years. Um, and I think that uh, I was impressed by the fact that, you know, he did express how much he had learned and also that he had a takeaway from it, that he could see where there were ways that he thought that the process could maybe work better. So it, I, <laughs> it, you know, it obviously matters to him. So you know, definitely qualified. Thank you. Pat? Yeah, and I've uh, worked with him in the past year, and I'm frequently surprised in a good way because, uh, because he brings up points. Um, sometimes that coincide with mine, but more often um, I, have, I hadn't been thinking of. And as somebody who is a naive finance committee member, when he asked the question that I had written down that I was too shy to ask. It, it helps me to learn yeah. uh, that I can trust myself more. Um, the other piece that uh, really um, makes me uh, interested in, in his thinking process is when he talked about changing the budget process, what he emphasized was collaboration and a real conversation. And that's what I think is missing in government, in our town government. Um, and, and I think it's missing from the Finance Committee because um, no shame or blame intended, everything is in its little pocket. And, and um, while there's participatory budgeting and different things like that, we're really challenged by those pockets. And, um, and I, you know, so I, I feel very strongly that I would like to see him uh, reappointed. Darcy, any thoughts you would like to add?
Thank you. Um, I think listening to him, it reminded me of my role as a counselor um, and my duty as a counselor to try and communicate to constituents the challenges we face. Um, because he touched on a number of things, and, and Pat picked up on it as well, the balkanization of our budget process, the, the difficulty of having a real dialogue. Um, also, though, the, the long-term liabilities that we face that people just don't think about. But we do. Certainly people on FinCom think about it, but we as counselors need to think about it. And I think we need to uh, communicate that to our constituents, that there are some real uh, uh, long-term liabilities that we have to, we struggle with that we can't just ignore, we can't just, so OPEB, infrastructure, the cost of actually fixing roads, um, and then the fact that the, the budget uh, process itself, uh, often it's in the hands of other bodies, and um, so there's no solutions, it's easy solution, but I think part of it, I got the sense for myself, speaking for myself, that, that I have to do a better job trying to help people understand it um, and understand the challenges. Um, I feel also strongly that, that this is a candidate who, um, as we, it's stated in our um, selection guidance that we give preference to someone who's served a first or second term. And while I've gone on record saying that that is a, I agree with that, um, it does not bind our hands. We're perfectly free to not follow that. But I think in this case, um, if I may speak out of turn, um, I'm going to follow Pat's lead, I guess. Um, this, he strikes me as someone who is eminently suited for a second term, given his experience, his thoughtfulness. Um, in another universe, Rika Clement would be candidate number one. Um, but in this case, where we have someone seeking a second term who has obviously done the job and um, um, has been so thoughtful, um, I am leaning very strongly to um, offering him a second term. Sarah, please go ahead. Okay, no, I just, you're perfectly free to speak up. Um, we've talked about both candidates. I don't know if Darcy has anything else to add, but I'm willing to entertain a motion at this point um, from a member of the committee, um, or I could make a motion, but I prefer to come from a member of the committee, but I'm uh, prepared for a motion. If you just hit the mic, please. I move that we reappoint Robert Hegner to the Finance Committee as a non-voting resident member. Okay. For a term to last. So it would start July 1, 2021. Starting July 1, 2021. Right. Are they two-year terms? Yes, they're two-year terms. So June 30, 2023. June 30, 2023. June 30th, 2023. That's why I didn't want to make the motion. <laughs> no, no. Thank you both, Mandy, actually. Um, so the motion has been made to um, offer Bob Hegner a second term um, beginning July 1, 2021 and ending June 30, 2023. Um, is there a second? Our yes, Narcy. Yes, did I misstate that? It, I apologize. It should be recommending to the town council. Uh, thank you, Darcy. Um, recommending to the town council that um, the town council reappoint Bob Hegner to a uh, term, uh, as we just stated. Thank you, Darcy. Is there a second? I'll second if no one else wants their name on it. All right, so we have a motion that's been seconded. Any further discussion? Sarah, please. So this seems awkward, but I think I'm always awkward in this committee. But I, I, am, I definitely value Bob's experience. But I'm going to break out and just say I, you know, one of the things that I, I usually don't support, so George and I are a little bit, is that I was so impressed by her that I would have rather picked her as, as my first choice um, simply because, as Mary Jo sometimes has you know, said, sometimes there's someone who comes out of the blue that um, you think is just a better fit. And I don't think that I ever felt that way <laughs> until today, but there you go. You can learn a lot of things. I just felt like she was just an amazing fit. And no mm -hmm. disrespect to Bob at all, but yeah. I'd so. Okay. Running around trying to figure out other ways to get her involved. Um, well, I, I think that's something she that is. the chair will yeah. certainly uh, attempt, um, as he does often with other 
candidates who are eminently suited suited for a position, but there are only there's only one position or two positions. Um, I do try to reach out to folks and suggest other, but I hear you, Mandy. So. I I'm going to, in some sense, support Sarah. Um, at the same time, I'm going to vote to r recommend Bob, although I think if we weren't just coming out of COVID, I would be, I would probably vote for, you know, support Rika. Um, you know, I, I've always struggled as many, you know, Sarah just acknowledged about the preference for reappointment, but the last year and a half of budgeting has been so um, hard, and we're going into a year that will be so hard that I, while I was very impressed with Rika and I would love to see her as the non-voting member, I, I do have to sway myself, I am swaying myself, I would say, to that lack of a learning curve that Bob will bring in this year when we're looking to try and add new programming and finding ways to fund all these different things that um, we, in reality, don't have the money to do. Um, you know, that, that the learning curve he's already undertaken, I think, will be valuable. Um, that I think it's just the wrong time for Rika, unfortunately, because I absolutely agree with you, Sarah, that, that I was extremely impressed and any other time she would have my vote. Any further, I'm sorry, Darcy, please. I see no hands raised, so no further comments. We have a motion that's been seconded. I'm going to proceed to vote. And um, uh, I'm going to start in alphabetical, see if I can do alphabetical order. Um, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, Darcy Dumont. Yes. Um, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Um, the chair is an aye, uh, Sarah Schwartz. No. So the vote is four to one against uh, to recommend Bob Hegner to a, a second term. Um, very good. Next item on our agenda is a, a moratorium, the moratorium, temporary moratorium bylaw. That bylaw is in your packet. Um, I think if, thank you, Mandy. And, um, she will make it larger. Thank you very much. Uh, Darcy, I am hoping that you have access to it as well so that you can see it. Um, you also, we also need access to um, the legal opinion that was provided by KP Law. That also is in your packet. And um, I don't think we have split screen capacity. Okay, well, we're gonna try and do split screen here, but um, I do have a physical copy. I have my computer open if someone needs to share, but hopefully everyone present and hopefully Darcy can access both the bylaw and the legal um, comment by uh, the town attorney on that bylaw. Our task is to uh, decide whether we wish to recommend this to the uh, town council as clear, uh, consistent, and actionable. That is our task. Uh, not to discuss the merits or demerits of this bylaw, but whether it is, uh, we can declare it clear, consistent, and actionable. Um, I think the attorney uh, decision addressed both actionability and clarity, and so I'm going to suggest we use that as our guidance, though obviously the members are free to speak as they wish. Um, and so I'm going to open the floor to discussion. Um, Please, go ahead.
So if I understand you, Darcy, you, you, there's been, you believe there's been a prior review by the town attorney? Well, it is the practice of this committee when a bylaw is presented to it um, to have it reviewed formally by the town council and to have either the, you, often it's an email submission. This, in this case, we were given something on letterhead, but some kind of written document that we can access and the public can access. Um, and so I think that was my reasoning. I'm not aware of a prior review. I've not seen a physical uh, copy or any kind of um, statement by anyone about that. Um, what I did and what we uh, do as practice here is through the town manager ask uh, the town attorney to review it. They have done that. They've given us a written uh, statement and that's what we look at. Um, we're also free just to apply our own uh, thoughts and reactions to the questions of actionability, clarity, and consistency. But with bylaws in particular, actionability is something that, that's important. And my reading of this, and I'm welcome to be uh, disagreed with, is that this is actionable. The attorney makes it clear that this, as it stands, um, uh, could be um, enacted. So it, it does seem to be actionable. The issue of clarity, however, they do raise some concerns. Um, and I don't know how much time we want to spend on this. Um, it would seem, I mean, also there's the question of what we can do, actually. Um, and I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Normally we have the sponsors present, but since this is by citizen petition, uh, it's not clear that we can actually do anything about the language other than simply note concerns if we have them, or maybe vote uh, yay or nay. And then if, if it got, get to the council at that level, language perhaps could be changed by the council. But I don't think we can do that um, given the nature of this particular submission. All we can do is have vote on it and uh, I can note in the report any concerns we have. Mandy. Yeah, um, based on the attorney's written opinion, I would agree that it is actionable, but it is not clear. Um, so I'm not sure I can I could vote to declare it clear. Right. I think I could vote to declare it, declare it. I don't even know consistency. I'd have to go back to our what is consistent. Um, but um, I could certainly declare it actionable. Um, to your other question, you know, this was put forth by a voter petition under state law. Um, I, I don't think we as a committee should have any right to change the language that the voters asked us to vote on. Now, once it gets to council, the council always has a right to amend stuff. But as a committee, I don't think we have a right to do that. I think that's what they asked us to vote on. That's what we put forth to the council. And we as a committee say it's either actionable or not. It's clear or not. We could go through and say, based on the attorney's um, opinion of clarity, if the council you know, desires this could be a recommended motion to amend, um, given the recommendations of both the planning board and the CRC, I don't know whether it's um, a wise use of time to do that, I would say. Um, I, I'm open to thoughts on that, but I think that's as far as we could go is just say to the council, here are some potential <clears throat> motions to amend that would might make it clearer. Um, but we, I think we should keep in mind that the planning board recommended not adoption by a 6-0 vote and CRC recommended not adoption by a 4-1 to vote um, in terms of our use of our time. Right. I mean, based on the attorney's decision, based on my understanding of what a bylaw should look like, um, my recommendation to uh, the council or to anyone who wish this to uh, be a bylaw would be to strike the first uh, paragraph completely. Um, it's not appropriate. 
I mean, it's perfectly well to be argued, and understanding the rationale is fine. But as a bylaw, I would think normally that would not be, that first paragraph would come out. Um, the sentence 180, six month moratorium, um, the issue of wood, um, whether it simply should be uh, this moratorium uh, provides that, simply a statement of fact, um, is a concern the attorney raised and, and what the meaning of wood would be. Uh, so I would, I would change that or suggest that that would be a change that should be considered. The, the bulk, the bylaw itself, the actual uh, content is, is, I don't have any, that, nothing to say about that. Um, the final question is the last two sentences, or the last sentence, <clears throat> where it says, um, if the town is not able to implement amended zoning bylaws addressing all of the areas listed in this section before 180 days, then there will be a 90-day extension of the temporary moratorium. And uh, again, is this a matter of content or a matter of, of, of just pure clarity? Um, maybe it's a matter of content, but the attorney raised the question, and I have to agree, that it would be absolutely uncertain what it would mean to address all of the areas. Um, that would be open to debate, to say the least. Um, so maybe that's, we just leave that, and the council could uh, debate that if they wished. Um, I think the question for us is whether we even want to spend uh, time to make recommendations to make this clearer, uh, which would be one option. The other would be to uh, vote on whether it's clear, consistent, actionable, and I would agree that there are at least two areas where clarity is lacking, or at least a concern. Um, so does that mean I would vote against it as not being clear, consistent, and actionable? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, I, we could vote it, and then in the, in, the, in the report, I could simply point out things that we have concerns about, or we could vote it, and depending how the vote goes, I guess it could be, here's some concerns, or here's why we didn't vote it clear, consistent, and actionable. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I have four other members on this committee, so. Um, and Darcy, we haven't heard from you. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Um, yeah. Yes, no, that is correct. You're absolutely right. Sarah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Sarah. So I'm just thinking that it, it wouldn't hurt because it is our goal, you know, clear, consistent, and actionable to, I don't think that it would be disrespectful when we send it to the council just to, if we, I mean, just like we would with a spelling mistake, I think because it's our job to make sure that something is clear, consistent, and actionable, couldn't we in our report just write the, the two areas of concern that we have because it, you know, the sponsors would know ahead of time, yeah, when it gets to council, I think it might um, direct some of our conversation or be more constructive? Well, I think, yes, I hear you. I think that whatever the vote is that I would put in the report, um, a summary of, of the discussion. I've identified three areas actually that um, based on the attorney review that I have concerns about. And um, depending on how we voted, it would either be um, the reason we voted in the negative is because of X, Y, and Z, or if we voted in the affirmative, uh, I would say, and the concerns were raised about, the vote was affirmative, but there were concerns raised about A, B, and C. The three things that I've highlighted are, and probably the reason why I will not vote to declare this clear, is that the first paragraph should be stricken. Um, I have a problem with the word wood. Um, uh, not sure what that means here. Um, and I have a problem with the, the last sentence where it seems completely unclear what um, would satisfy that statement. So um, I'm probably leaning towards voting against this simply on those grounds. Um, 
if the committee decides that it is clear, consistent, actionable um, in my report, I would just note those three things. And I'd note anything else that people wanted to note, but that's my thought. Mandy. So I'd like to make a motion and then I'll speak to why I'm making the motion I'm making. All right, um, The motion is to declare the Article 16 temporary moratorium for 180 days on building permits for construction of residential buildings with three or more dwelling units. Get that down. <laughs> it's right up there. <laughs> Actionable, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> but not clear or consistent. So that's the motion. Okay. That's the motion. Uh, I think if there, if it gets a second, I'll explain well, why I okay. say both I, of those. I will second it just to okay. hear your reasoning. Okay, I'm seconding. So I okay. pulled up the revised guidelines for review, clear, consistent, and actionable that GOL has adopted. <laughs> okay. And clarity is a measure will be found clear if it is understandable, comprehensible, and unambiguous. Um, the GOL committee will be the ultimate arbiter of whether a measure is clear. However, the GOL committee will seek to collaborate with sponsors. We've talked about that part. Right. Um, if a sponsor will not be required to change language, refusal to do so may result in a recommendation that the measure is not clear, along with a recommendation for change that would make the language clear. So I think that goes to what we've been talking about is the report could discuss what the um, town attorney said um, about recommendations, but because this is a voter petition, we just don't feel like we can even ask for language to be changed at this right. point. Um, consistent, a measure will be found consistent if the content does not contradict itself, the form is consistent with the form and or organization of similar measures, i.e. numbering system for bylaws and stuff like that. And I think the preamble and just that it has no numbers um, of any of the paragraphs or bullet points or anything makes it inconsistent with how we just do bylaws, so that's why I chose inconsistent. Actionable, um, a measure will be found actionable if it does not conflict with Massachusetts general law, the Amherst Home Rule Charter, or any other law, bylaw, policy, or resolution applicable to the town. We've got a town attorney opinion that it is a valid zoning bylaw. Um, so I think that, in my opinion, requires us to declare it actionable. Sarah? A couple questions. And one is, does GOL have um, like a certain procedure for when we have these coming from the, the public? Am I just being feeling lost that it feels like, I feel like I'm floundering because usually we can hammer out these things and usually, you know, we can pretty much make them clear, consistent, and actionable when they go to the council. So I guess I'm just wondering if we have a different set of rules when it's several, you know, it's just the public in general. And also, you know, will the, when it goes to town council, will people who brought this forward be able to hammer things out with us in a uh, constructive way? Mandy, please. In, in the past, as George would confirm, we've had them sitting here, at least with resolutions and all, and it's normally one or two people. The problem is this with a voter petition under petitioning rules is approximately 200, I believe, is the ultimate number that we're certified. It, you can't get, a, I'm assuming you can't get agreement of all 200 or speak to all 200. That's, that's part of the issue, I think. At least with me is, yes, we've got counselors who were sort of sponsors-ish, but they made clear at the public hearing for CRC and planning board that they didn't speak for everyone that signed that petition, everyone had their own, but that's the language they signed. And so I feel very uncomfortable trying to hammer that out because it would only be one subset of everyone who signed it and everyone who signed it, I feel expects this language to be what is initially presented on the motion sheet at the council. And then the council can do what it, it wants with it. Like it can even if it comes out of GOL with language right. that if it was proposed by the planning department, planning department agreed to, council can still say, eh, we don't like that, we're moving it and changing it. Um, so, but I guess that's why I'm uncomfortable making any changes until it goes to the council because there's 200 plus people, as far as I know, that asked for this specific language. Please go ahead. Don't feel that we have the ability to make it clear and consistent. 
Well, Darcy, there's not a normal procedure in the sense that anything that comes before us, the sponsors are invited to attend. They don't have to attend. Um, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Um, and then we engage in a conversation and we work very hard. And I think we've had great success in achieving agreement um, with the sponsors present. But nothing requires the sponsors to be present and nothing requires us to uh, make a change to uh, you know, work with them in that way, but we do. This, in this case, is simply not, po given the nature of this uh, uh, document, there's no way we can engage in that kind of uh, voluntary process. So it's going to fall to the council or members of the council who uh, perhaps support this um, to do what they want to do at the council level. But at the committee level, um, I think Mandy spelled out pretty clearly um, what we can and cannot do. Um, so the motion is, uh, and I think what I like about the motion is that it distinguishes the three categories and says, offers the idea that while this is, we agree is actionable, um, the motion suggests that it, it lacks clarity and consistency, and she has identified, if I'm correct, three areas where that is the case. It's not consistent in the sense of the form in which bylaws are normally presented and the lack of numbering. It's not consistent in the language of the preamble, which is not appropriate to a bylaw. Um, it's unclear in the use of the word would under 180 day, six month moratorium. Um, and finally, it's ambiguous in the last two sent in the last sentence. Um, so that's where we have the um, specifics. I think the question for the committee and the only question is as a member of the committee, um, do you agree with that analysis? And if you do, then I assume you would support the motion. If you don't, then I assume you would not support the motion. Uh, so Pat. I'm no, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Darcy. Uh, um, Darcy, go ahead. No, no. The, our, our charge is to declare something clear, consistent, and actionable. Those three are different, as Mandy's pointed out to us. They are three very different things. And um, all we're doing is giving the council advice. We're saying to the council, in our opinion, whatever the vote turns out to be, could be 5-0, it could be 3-2, to two, um, or whatever, 4-1. to one. In the opinion of a majority of the, council, of the members of this committee, this document that you have in front of you is a, B, and C. And the motion here is to suggest that while it is A, namely actionable, there are issues um, with B and C. Um, and that's something for us to decide. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, no, it's going to go to the council no matter what we do. Well, from our perspective, actually, it is <laughs> in this committee. I mean, we, this is an unusual committee. Uh, we're into the dotting I's, crossing T's, and it is actually important um, to this committee. At the council level, you may be right. It, may I? Oh, Pat, please. Oh, Sarah. OK. Sarah, please. So I guess this is what I'm thinking is, you know, we're, we got this third year because we we're trying to figure out all the rules, right? Mm -hmm. And how things actually are clear, consistent, and actionable, even in our charter. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my thought, and I'm not even sure if it's a question, but in this case, then, it almost seems like voters bringing something forward together actually become penalized because over, if it's over, say, 60 people or 50 people, what council is saying is there's absolutely no way that we can reach out to all of you or try to get you in one room or give you the benefit of GOL's expertise to make something clear, consi consistent, and actionable. So I guess I'm just wondering, since we deal with rules, is this something that maybe we want to think about? I mean, is it, or can we even? I mean, in order to say, like, if one, if one of these is brought to us again, you know, is, could we have some kind of procedure where we could even ask people like over a certain amount of, of people to name two people to speak for them? I just, I feel like we're penalizing people because we're saying we just can't work with this. So that's just my question. It doesn't have to be answered now. 
Yeah, and I was going to comment on something similar in that um, I don't care how many people sign this. They have some agreement because they put out this document. So I think that they could have representatives or all 200 could show up. I doubt that would happen. But I think that we could ask for representatives to address issues of cl the issues that the committee has. Um, and I think that uh, at this point, it, just as a council member voting on the moratorium, I couldn't support it because of the things that, uh, that have come up about clarity and consistency. Um, so I want those things addressed. I don't think we're penalizing. We're, if we didn't invite anybody to speak, and we had three counselors, I think it was Darcy and uh, Dorothy and Kathy, and none of them are, well, Darcy, you're here, but. Um, yes. So it's either we need to go ahead and, and try to hammer those things out with Darcy, or we bring it to the council, which I think is the best thing to do, and say, this is actionable. However, these are concerns, and we want you to recognize those concerns before you vote. So I, you know, so I don't. Yeah, I think that that is our task. And uh, it is complicated by the fact it's a citizen petition. But that's the nature of a citizen petition. Um, and I think at the council level, that can be addressed. But at our level, um, all we can do is offer our advice to the council on this particular document. And that's something we need to vote on. We have a motion in front of us. It's been seconded. Any further discussion? Then I'm going to go to a vote, and I'm going to go in alphabetical order again. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Um, Darcy Dumont. Aye. OK. Um, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Um, the chair is an aye. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. So the vote is four in favor of the motion and one abstaining. Um, the motion is to uh, recommend to the town council, well, actually, I'm sorry, to declare to the town council that this um, bylaw is actionable but is not clear and consistent. And I will, in my report, identify those specific areas that we've spoken about. And um, then the council will be up to the council to decide. Yes. Say that we are inviting. Uh, residents who, you know, petition supporters or whatever, who, um, to mm. speak, to be at the meeting so they can, uh, they can uh, weigh in on this or, or their representatives could weigh in on it because I mean, I Dar Darcy's here and she'll know to, to say that, but it seems to me they, if we're dealing with a citizen's petition, we need to somehow or other get out the information that when we engage in this process, we need some attendance from the people, not all of them, or I don't know. I'm, I hear you, but I'm not sure that that's the job of this committee or of the report that I'll be writing. Okay. Um, so I think I'm probably not going to do that, but I'm open to. Um, I will note the challenge that this presents. I will note the discussion that um, at some point, we might want to come back to as a committee, um, you know, because this is the first time, and my, I think it's true, and the first time we've had to deal with something that's a citizen petition. Is there some other process we could conceivably come up with? I'm dubious, but that's something we should talk about. And I'll note that. But I don't think I'm going to issue a, an invitation one way or the other. Okay, all right. We have in front of us uh, also uh, in your packet, and I urge you to, um, Mandy's been great as always to get this up on the screen, but we have a, um, a citation that is up for our review, um, and it's been in your packet. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. This um, actually was originally um, brought to my attention through the town manager's report. Um, I shared that with a, a fellow counselor, and um, I shared a draft of, of the citation. And so right now it's in draft form. It's been looked at by three members of this 
committee. Um, and at the moment, I think all three names are on this, but that's open, obviously, to uh, discussion. But at the moment, we have um, on the screen, and Darcy, hopefully you have at home access to the um, citation. It reads, Citation and Recognition of Officer Rita Curley, Nay Contardo, upon receiving the Law Enforcement Exemplary Performance Award from the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. Um, I think we need to go through this. I, I think carefully it's been, Mandy has gone through it, I've gone through it, Pat's looked at it. Um, one concern, very practical concern, and I reached out to the uh, chief and with a question to which he provided a email response, which is also in your packet. It's in, in SharePoint. Um, and I'm going to try and dig it up on my computer. Um, as usual, my computer decides to log off because I wasn't paying attention to it, gets offended. All right. Um, let me find, I believe it's in, I hope it's in here. Rito, Rita Contardo dash Curly. That's what the chief suggested. And I, I, um, I, you know, beyond just whether, you know, support for this or whatever, it's just a practical question. Um, she now goes by the name Rita Curley, but when this uh, incident took place, um, and as the chief says in his email, she's known to many people in the community by her uh, maiden name, Contardo. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, I think we should go by her current name. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I, I have a question of is when was she given this award? I don't know the answer to that, and that's a good because question. Because the incident happened over a year ago, right. yeah. uh, and I'm interested in when the uh, award was given. Okay. So my memory from the town manager's report is that because of COVID, the DMH did not issue awards in 2020. They issued awards in 2021 for actions in both 20 and 2021, and that's why we were notified. Just a month or so ago about her award that it was actually awarded sometime this year. The town manager included this this notification in his town manager report. I think two reports in a row, but uh, June. I'm not sure the date. One of the May ones yeah. I know was one of them. Yeah. But your understanding is the, the award was given in 20. 20? The, incident. the incident. incident. I'm sorry. Yeah. Incident in 2020. The award in 2021. Sarah. Sarah, please. Do we know how DMH does this award? Was the individual who was having extraordinarily distressing mental health issues, were, did, did they say, yes, please use this? incident and I definitely want to commend the officer. I just, to someone who has had people in their direct family who have tried to commit suicide, um, I, I'm just interested as if the person who was that distressed gave their permission. Um, and I, I guess I also have, I, I have some problems with some of the wording you know, about how this individual, you know, was trying to attack an officer. I just, I'm just wondering if we know how DMH um, awards this. When you ask how, what do you mean? So does the Department of Mental Health say to people, um, we have this award that we give every year to a police officer. Mm -hmm. Is there a police officer that has helped you and changed your life in a certain incident that you had? Mm -hmm. Would you like to write about your incident and nominate this person? Or right. do social workers say, I got this information and 
I read this report and I, golly, I think this police officer did amazing. I'm, I guess I'm, I just, I don't want this, I'm just interested in whether or not the person who actually had an issue right. was, was volunteering or involved it. in the process. And your reason for that is because? I think that the things that are, are some of the things that are worded in here, um, well, one of the, okay. Right. The first sure. thing is, is when you try to commit, okay, and committing suicide is a wrong term. Mm -hmm. When you are in that desperate situation, that's a very personal situation. I, I, I am a, a mother and a granddaughter of, of people who have been in that situation. I don't really know of too many people who volunteer that up, and I would just feel, and I'm just uncomfortable with some of the combative wording, and I'm just, well, I think this is good. We can go through the wording, but I think you're raising a larger concern that you're uncomfortable with this citation if it didn't actually involve the permission or engage the, uh, the person who was the, uh, and even though the person is not identified by name, and uh, so it's, you still have that concern. Yes, because it's their life circumstances. Well, their life circumstances uh, through uh, their actions intersected with the life circumstances of a whole group of people on that day, not just uh, Officer Curley, but a whole host of other people, including, I assume, bystanders, who uh, suddenly found their lives um, impacted by the actions of an individual. So many people um, were impacted by this event um, because it was in public and presented a threat to first of all, the individual, but also to the public at large, and as we see in the citation, eventually posed a threat to Officer Curley herself. So I guess I'm struggling with the idea that somehow um, we have complete privacy to anything that uh, transpires in our life and cannot be part of any public uh, acknowledgement unless we give permission. Um, I would agree if uh, a name was used. I would also perhaps be open to the thought that uh, perhaps some of the details could be removed um, that might identify it on a particular date um, or place. But I really do struggle with the idea that somehow um, you have a right to basically um, control whatever is said or spoken about you um, I, that I just struggle with. So, um, but I do hear your concern, and perhaps that is something we're going to need to talk about some more. Um, the language, specific language, we can go through um, if we decide to proceed. Um, but there may be a larger issue at, is at here. Mandy? Uh, um, I understand the concern, Sarah. Um, and as one of the people whose names on this, I would support um, removing some of the more identifying information. I know we've got a specific date in here, which given police reports is probably really easy then to identify an actual person by. And I think we need to be sensitive to those issues. Um, I also respect um, your concern about the language used because uh, individuals who find themselves having reached a mental crisis and health crisis at this point, um, the, the descriptions used need to definitely be more sensitive than maybe we were um, in this in this um, citation, um, you know. And it's not something I had thought of, particularly in looking at specific wording. So I definitely support looking at the specific wording to um, lessen the ability to potentially through this citation. Um, identify, having people be able to identify who was involved, um, who was going through the crisis, um, and also fix the language to better reflect the, um, the mental state and intentions of that person. You know, it, it can be very cruel to, to use words like attack at that point, even if that's from 
um, one officer's point of view that that's what was happening. From another point of view, it was something else. So I, I think we should try and work on maybe fixing the language there. Unfortunately, what we cannot fix is that the town manager included nearly this identical language because it was taken from the town manager's report. So this language was included in a town manager report that is already public. Um, so while we can fix this citation, we can't fix that on our own. Um, but I support fixing the citation to address your concerns. They are very real and, and worthy. Uh, Darcy, go ahead. Microphone. Thank you. I want to thank you for uh, bringing up, uh, sharing your perspective on the personal nature of this. And it made me realize I have in my little office at home um, uh, a citation uh, and, and, and publicity that went out for my brother when he was a police officer for winning, uh, getting an award for mm -hmm. bravery and different things. At no point was anything listed about the content of the engagement. Mm -hmm. It didn't say any. It just said, you know, on the, you know he did this and he's getting this award. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I feel like most of this can be removed. Um, so that's it, it, it. Really helped me to think about that. He, she deserves this award, no doubt. Um, but all the details are not what mm -hmm. should be shared publicly, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. any of them. Um, okay. And, <laughs> I think I would um, say that most likely the town manager included the level of detail that he did because he was pretty much copying it from the uh, citation. No, no, I'm not judging no, his no, action. Just, right, right. Uh, it's out there. It doesn't right. mean that we In have to words, continue it's not it. Only out and there and, and I report, honestly right. think that if we don't remove that and just find a neutral way, not a, not neutral, we're, we're saying, hey, this was incredible and this is how we would like police officers to act. I understand that. Um, but I want my, I will not be able to keep my name on it if we have the incident described in detail. No, I, I hear you. I hear Sarah. Um, and I think we need to go through it carefully if, if people are, if you are willing, and hopefully we can do it in a reasonable period of time. Um, I think, well, let's just go through it. I think it, it's important to me as a sponsor that there'd be sufficient detail, at least some in some form, to understand um, uh, the uh, nature of, of why she got the award. So, but I agree that the devil is gonna be in the details. So let's, let's go through it. Sarah? I just wanna say that I, I don't think that I can support this even if we <clears throat> change the language. So I would leave it up to the rest of you to decide how you wanna do that. I'm going to excuse myself. Okay. So the minutes should note that um, at 12:10, uh, Councillor Schwartz left the meeting.
You have the same problem I do with your computer? Thank you. Um, so I would like to go through this, and I would like to uh, um, see if we can resolve it. Um, what I'm hearing is that the level of detail is, is too much and needs to be removed, perhaps um, almost all of it or most of it, um, to uh, protect the confidentiality of the individual involved. And I think the, um, so that's what I'm hearing. Again, I'm back to the question of how to refer to Officer Curley. Um, thoughts, please. I mean, with that, I think we should go with what the chief recommended. So, Contardo dash Curley. Yeah. I guess my problem with that is that is not actually how she refers to herself. We um, could skip the dash. <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah, I don't know. Pat? I think she should be listed as she refers to herself. Rita so, Curley. Rita Curley. That's who she is. Um, and then keep the Nay Contardo and then through the rest of it just refer to as Rita Curley? Or would you just, just say? I, I, I wonder if, given that it's almost 12.30 and we have some other things to do, you know, I, I would love to see this at the council meeting on Monday night, but if we're going to be rewriting the whole thing, um, mm -hmm. yeah. we might not want to do that in a public meeting. We might need to confer later. Um, All right, I, so I wouldn't the, mind that because it would give me a chance to look at how my brother's thing is yeah. written. And I think that would be very helpful. Yeah. Okay. So I'm getting a sense, and certainly Darcy, speak up if you disagree, that from the, uh, the consensus from the committee that they would like to postpone this for a future meeting and give people a chance to uh, think more about it. All right. Um, Could up, we yes. take a two-minute break? Um, yeah, want to take a two-minute break? Sure. Yeah, I'd like to see if our other committee member might have stayed in the building All since right. we've moved off this issue, and if she would be okay. able and capable of joining us for the next part. Okay. Let's uh, for a moment. I'm going to hit the pause button. Actually, which is the pause button? <laughs> Help. This is no, the, that's the stop. This one's the pause. Thank you. Thank you, Darcy. I uh, appreciate your patience. We uh, hopefully you were able to enjoy that break too. Um, good. We are recording again, so we are back. And uh, my understanding is that what oh, I'm going to encourage is the sponsors uh, review this and bring it back to GOL with the uh, taking into consideration the comments that have been made about the level of detail and uh, and we will take it up uh, we and perhaps at our next meeting which is a week from today need i remind you and so that's the next item update on dab applications in process um, we did eventually we had 18 candidates um, but uh, three withdrew, four um, did not submit SOIs. So we actually have 11 candidates who have submitted SOIs. And given the nature of the charge, um, which requires that there be no more than two, res two um, members from any given district and at least one from every district, we will face a bit of a challenge. We, um, we're going to be, uh, we're not going to have a lot of choice. The only district where there is really a, um, we have multiple candidates that will require our close review is District 1. The other districts have um, either only two applicants or had three applicants and only two submitted an SOI. Yes, we have. We do have a applicant for all five districts, and we have 
two we have two possible uh, places. So we're going to end up with eight. It's the maximum number we can come up with at the moment, which is sufficient for quorum and sufficient for this body to get started. And then at that point, I don't know what we'll decide. I'm not sure we're going to decide it today. Whether uh, I think maybe it makes sense to simply we have our meeting. It's been posted. The SOIs are available. Um, so we will proceed with that and we will make our decision on the 23rd. And I guess what I'm just telling you in advance is that no matter what transpires between uh, now and then, we'll only be able to fill eight of the nine positions. And that's not saying we'll fill all eight positions, but I think it's likely we will, but only eight is possible. So we will be short one, but there will be a representative from all five districts. Mandy, I'm sorry, Mandy first and then Darcy. All right, Darcy first. Can you say again why, why not? Why, what? I'm sorry. We can't appoint nine in the current configuration because of uh, the fact that. Um, two in each district and one, it, it comes up one short. So, so it's just a mathematical. Um, it, is it a clarity that two districts only have one applicant and three right. districts have a minimum of two applicants? That's right. And, and our charge says we cannot appoint more than two from any one district. So right. even though we have 11 applicants, right. given those right. restrictions right. and who submitted eights, the maximum we'll be able to appoint. Is that right? That is correct. Thank you. So that's the reason, Darcy, it's just a matter of the math and the, and the charge language. What I'm assuming is that going forward after the 23rd, we could still solicit um, a ninth candidate, but it would have to be from a specific district, which would be, my memory is, I believe it's District 4. Yeah? So I know we have a process that says that the names get published a week before the meeting, which is why, in theory, today is the last day people could submit SOIs for it and all. Um, given that we're not actually interviewing, um, I feel like I should bring up the option. You know, we created the process. We can change our own process, right? right. Um, that if an SOI is submitted before, say, Monday um, or Sunday night, you know, so that you could modify an agenda on Monday for a Wednesday agenda or get an SOI, would this committee be willing to accept that um, in an attempt to be able to fill all nine? Or frankly, you know, we, we declare pools sufficient because they, in theory, had more than two applicants per, and if we've ended up with just two, you know, to give us a potentially a more sufficient pool. I, I just thought I'd bring no, up no, that I, option I, I, I know, I know. to I, see what the committee but, thought about that. You know, that would mean going back to the four people who haven't submitted and say, in spite of what we said, in spite of all the rules, in spite of the right, da, 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 you can still submit. And I just have, I'm comfortable with that. I think I'd be more comfortable with going forward with the process as we've defined it, um, and then communicating to the council once again, and to the public once again, that um, we're still looking for a ninth member, but this body can certainly fulfill its duties with eight members. It has a quorum, um, so I'm, I'm not really eager to do that, follow that tack, because um, everyone else has done what we asked them to do, and now we're gonna say, well, you know, so, I, so that's my thought. Please, Darcy, go ahead. We had 18, Darcy. Four did not, we had 18, 18 submissions. And four did not, four did not submit, and three withdrew. Yeah, no, I get that. Okay. Um, the four that did not, I mean, right, they did not submit, they were, right. It makes sense to um, allow the four people to submit, but allow the
Yes. I don't know what they, I mean, they fill in on the calf what they choose to fill in. Um, but uh, yes, everyone submitted a calf, and the calves, I believe, are, have been available to you all along. They've been available to every member of this committee. It provides demographic information as well. That's how we, uh, that's how I figure out uh, race, gender, age is from the calf. Right. Right. Calf. Calf. We fill in all the substantive questions that are asked. Because, well, yeah, it, I understand. Mandy, please. Yeah, so I think we have to remember that we changed the CAF form within the last three years, and so some of the finance people that submitted CAF submitted a CAF in the old form, and we weren't requiring them to submit a new one because we as a council have changed the CAF form. And so what you might have been looking at, especially with Mr. Hegner, who the CAF was from two years ago when he got appointed, um, mm -hmm. is an old CAF form, um, and all the DAB ones will be on the new form. Right, the, cur the current CAFs do not allow for, do not invite any kind of um, discussion of your merits or making your case. They're simply expression of interest for a particular body or bodies and basic demographic information that's crucial to this committee and to the council in its effort to achieve diversity um, on, its, on its bodies and boards. So that's what the CAFs are today. You, every council member gets a copy of every CAF for a council appointed body. Um, I believe, I hope, I placed the CAFs in the packet. Um, I should have, but uh, obviously you have them. Um, and as Manny pointed out, there may be still a few people from the old days. Uh, can't be many, um, but there might be a few under the old system where yes, you could and people did submit a statement, equivalent, somewhat equivalent to a statement of interest. But our current procedure, we're very explicit about it. And we're also very explicit. We send them a description of what we expect in an SOI. Um, and we make it clear why it's being solicited. And they're reminded. I actually reminded there were three <laughs> reminders sent to all the candidates, including one um, uh, Sunday. I think it was Sunday night. Um, so just four people, for whatever reason, simply chose not to submit. And three people reached out to me in advance, which I appreciated and for various reasons said they had to withdraw. So that's why we ended up with 11. Uh, well, I, I will discuss, I mean, yeah, I mean, I can, I guess, at some point. I don't have them in my head at the moment. Um, in, that would be inappropriate in a public meeting because we don't disclose non-applicant names. So if, if a committee member or even a counselor wants to desire to compare the CAFs that were submitted to the SOIs that were submitted, that person can figure it out on their own. But to disclose that in a public meeting would be inappropriate. Would be inappropriate. OK, I hear you. So yes, you can figure it out, Darcy, if you wish. Um, we have two sets of minutes. Um, I've looked at them. I've made very minor changes. Emily has done her usual good job. Um, I'm sorry? If you wish, um, I would like to entertain him. I'm sorry? Well, that's all right. They're here. I think if it's the most recent one, it might show the changes. Um, I hopefully, I, th I think I took out. Are you on SharePoint or are you on? It's what I downloaded from SharePoint. OK. Well, it should be here. Well, um, they were very minor changes, um, nothing substantive. But um, 
I would like, I'm going to make a motion that we approve the minutes of May 19 and June 2, 2021, as amended by the chair. Is there a second? Second, second by DeAngelis. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'm going to go immediately to a vote. And this time, I'm not going to go in alphabetical order. Um, I'm going to start with Manny Johanneke. Aye. Uh, the chair is an aye. Uh, Darcy Dumont. Yes. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. The vote is 4-0 with one member absent to approve the minutes of May 19 and June 2nd. And again, our great appreciation and thanks to Emily, our note taker. Um, I have no items unanticipated. Future agenda item, very simple. June 23, we will be dealing with uh, DAB. Um, it's possible we may have one citation. Uh, we'll see what the sponsors uh, do. Um, and then on June 30, it is my intention as chair to, I'm sorry, Mandy. Sorry. Um, maybe IZ, if we can get the opinion back from the attorney. Now, here's a good case. Uh, I, I have utmost respect for the town manager. I have a small sense of, a very small sense, of the enormous amount of things he has to deal with on a daily basis. But I have sent him two emails um, asking him just to confirm that he has received. Um, so maybe what I'm going to do is just go up. I have to go upstairs anyway. Um, and I'm just going to stick my head in the door in the middle of a meeting and scream. No, he has not, he's usually good about this. But I sent him the IC as soon as I got it asked for him to confirm, heard nothing, sent him a separate email and said, Paul, you're great. Would you just confirm you got it? I haven't heard nothing. My assumption is he sent it on, but I don't know. So at the moment, it's in limbo. And it is something that does definitely need to be looked at by the town attorney, not that they all don't need to be looked at, but so that's where it's at. I don't know. Thank you for that update. I, I asked because um, as chair of CRC, I've been informed that June 28th is zoning day at the council, um, and IZ is one of the ones we'd like to, the planning department and and CRC, given that it's over with, is hoping so to get I'd on for a first reading. I'd be willing to reach out to Paul directly um, today and ask him if it's possible to get it. You would like it for the so, June 23? So June 23 GOL is the only, it, right. we'd need it for that in right. order to put it on as a first reading on June 28th. Right, okay, so um, need And for the first goal reading. of, everyone in planning is to get it on June 28th, council for our first reading. So you, okay, I hear that, thank you. So we need it um, And he June should 23th. know that through agenda setting. No, I'm sure he since does. <laughs> that my information's come from yeah. Lynn. No, okay. <laughs> no, I'm sure he does. And I'm, he's probably sent it out, he just never got back to me. But I will double check again. So we could very well have that. We would hope we would have that on our agenda to review for clear, consistent, and actionable. We may have a citation, but the bulk of the meeting will be sent, spent on DAB. As I pointed out, um, my understanding of this, well, my clear understanding of the situation is there's only one district where there's going to be uh, District 1. So in, in, in advance of the meeting, you might want to look closely at District 1 um, and give, you, give some thoughts. Um, and also, please keep in mind our selection guidance, which um, we've adopted. Um, so, and June 30, just, um, I, for the DABs, yes. Okay, but. Are the you, SOIs on SharePoint? SOIs okay. are already on, posted. posted okay. And the CAFs, obviously, I almost made that mistake the very first time. Just, just go and get it. I mean, if you really have trouble, I'd be happy to, but it, it, they're all there. Uh, and they're both on SharePoint, I believe, as well. Um, but if you have trouble, just reach out to me and I will get them to you. Um, Darcy, this is for you, but also for the whole committee. I'm devoting all of June 30 to the process that we've been working on. That's the only item on the agenda. My hope is to get through it. Um, and the only thing that could put a bollocks in that would be some sudden appearance of a citation, whatever. But I'm gonna do everything in my power to prevent that to June 30 is going to be focused, hopefully, only on the process that we've been working on in terms of recommendations to uh, the uh, uh, council on council-appointed bodies. And that takes us through June. 
And then in July, I believe we're all going to Cancun. Is that right? No. no? Where would you go? Uh, where do you want to go? I want to go to the Arctic. You want to go to the Arctic, okay. So it's, it's on the website, I just confirmed, but that does not appear to be in SharePoint right now. The June 23rd packet is okay. not in SharePoint. Oh, it right. is it posted on the website, that's though, because right. I just pulled it from the website. Because the chair didn't put it on there. That's right. So I will put it on SharePoint. Okay. Um, Okay, but I will put it on SharePoint. Any other, so that's it. Um, I'm prepared to adjourn this meeting. Um, Darcy, thank you for your presence. And, and Can you just confirm the public comment part? I keep making <laughs> that, thank you very much. Does someone have, I, I have something to say. No, no, I'm <laughs> serious. I, oh, that's right, the public is here. Yes, the public is here, usual. <sighs> Seeing no members of the public present, I declare this meeting of GOL adjourned.